<laughs> I know. Well, you, I mean, you don't, you all heard it, right? And I, I won't deny that I said that. So. <laughs> all right. So today we're, we're going to talk about learning. So what does learned behavior look like? What are the different categories of learned behavior? Are all animals capable of learned behavior? Do all animals learn? It's, these, these are wonderful, wonderful questions. And so as we move through here, what, I'm just going to say this right now. You might want to jot this down. As we're going to move from very, what you would consider unsophisticated, simple learned behavior to more complex, more sophisticated learned behavior. So there's, there's a grade to this. Not all learned behavior is equal. All right? So first thing we're going to talk about is called imprinting. You don't need to write everything that's on it. But it was Okay, let me go back. Okay, so learning, the modification of behavior based on specific experiences. Learning, the modification of behavior based on specific experience. Notice this does not say the modification of behavior based on development, because then it would be an innate behavior still, just something that shows up later in development, like the claw waving, right? So that's, that's a change in behavior that happens as a result of development and not as a result of experiences. You're like, well, isn't development an experience? It is, but kind of dealt with differently. All right, now, so imprinting. Um, imprinting, you probably have all heard this before. You've probably all even seen some examples of imprinting. Um, have any of you ever read the book, Are You My Mother? About the little baby bird that falls out of the nest and finds like a dog. It's like, are you my mother? Finds a cow, are you my mother? And then ultimately finds a snort, thinks the snort is his mother, snort puts him back in the nest, finally his mother returns. It's, it's a great story, but it's, it's, it's absurd because birds imprint. And imprinting is a combination of both innate behavior and learning. Um, but birds, if birds have parents that care for them, birds associate whatever they first see as their parents which is really nice if you're a bird that doesn't like to raise your own chicks, right? Let's assume for a minute you are a bird that you do not want to go through the trouble of raising your own children. So you want to lay your eggs in another bird's nest and have them raise your children for you. Well, you can take advantage of the fact that your chicks are going to imprint on those, think those are mom and dad, they're going to take the food from it. And then you don't actually have to raise your own offspring, somebody else to do it for you. Yeah, those are, cowbirds do this, cuckoos do this, and they are what are called nest parasites. They lay their eggs in other birds' nests and take advantage of imprinting. But imprinting is actually really cool. Again, it's a combination of both innate and learned behaviors. That's, that's kind of the big key idea uh, to, to write down in this section, that imprinting a combination of innate and learn behaviors. And uh, we see this a lot in birds. So you got an example that comes out of your text, and this has some wonderful pictures for it. Again, remember. Hi, I'm Abulos. I'm getting signed up. What's that? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Sorry, is that what the phone call was about? OK. Yeah. So like. My dog, he was walking with like my neighbor's dog, and oh okay. my god, he was like not raised his leg, but after he saw my neighbor's dog do it, he started raising his leg. Yeah, it's learned behavior. Okay. Yeah, so the question, I want to make sure this gets on the, uh, the, the recording. The question was, um, my dog, well it's the setup, my dog used to pee not raising his leg, saw another dog pee raising his leg, and now he pees raising his leg, and that is an example of learned behavior. All right. All right, so uh, a very common example for imprinting uh, is in geese. The nice thing about ducks and geese is they have a lot of chicks. And so you get a lot of data to study, a lot of data to study. And so this comes right out of the, the text. You have a man, Conrad Lawrence, that studied uh, imprinting and actually provided a huge amount of research that had actually been really helpful for us to work with critically endangered birds. 
Anyways, we'll get to that. So here is Conrad Lawrence. Uh, he takes the he took the eggs out of the nest, and so when the geese would hatch, or goslings at that point, when the goslings would hatch, he was what they saw, and so now he is Mama, and they basically uh, be, they follow him around and and wait for him to provide them food, and and this helped us to understand imprinting a great deal, which has actually been really helpful for helping us to work with some endangered animals. Here are whooping cranes, which at one point, I think there were 68 uh, individuals left in the wild. Uh, that number, it sounds right, it may not be exactly right. And so they, they pulled them into captivity and started raising them in captivity. And what happened was they started to become really comfortable with humans. And so what we did was, okay, well, why don't we pretend to be cranes and so we can actually teach them to behave properly like cranes. So notice, can you see what this person's wearing inside of here? Can you see that from there? Here, let me, let me, let me do, oh no, I don't have the other, there's a, a blown up picture of, of Conrad Lawrence and his geese. They're wearing a crane suit. They're all white body suits. It's, it's, it's got a little beak on it. So they actually look like a crane. And then, so they'll teach the baby cranes how to be cranes. And then here they're even teaching them how to migrate, which migration is a, again, like imprinting is a combination of both innate and learned behavior. And so they get in a crane plane and teach them how to migrate. So wonderful, so wonderful. All right, so yeah, we already mentioned, oh, here it is, here it is. This just says, We've used Conrad Lauren's work in imprinting to help endangered species. I mentioned that already, right? Okay. And then here it is. Here's a bigger picture. Now can you see it? Yeah. That white bodysuit? That's a crane suit right there. That is awesome. That is awesome. So they've done a lot of this work with California condors. I don't know if you know much about California condors, but they're either the state bird or they're the... Yeah, I think they're the state bird. Yeah. yeah. Anyways, and they're wonderful animals. They're huge. They're like turkey vultures, but they're humongous. And so they're incredible. They do a really good job cleaning up dead animals so that we don't have to. But they're really, really dumb birds. They're really dumb birds. And I don't know why. They're just, they're, they're not very intelligent. But I'll give you an example of, 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 of their uh, lack of intelligence. Okay, so I don't know if you know this or not. But birds have to swallow really hard objects in order to grind their food down. Their stomach doesn't work exactly like our stomach. They have what's called a gizzard. Do any, do any of you eat chicken gizzards or turkey gizzards? They're delicious. Anyways, um, anyways, so they, the birds have to swallow hard objects, usually rocks, that then this muscular gizzard uses to grind down their food. It contracts and grinds the food with the rocks. But uh, condors swallow everything, pieces of glass, metal, uh, it doesn't matter what it is. And so a lot of them die from heavy metal poisoning. Um, between, between loss of habitat, hunting, and just heavy metal poisoning, you had a really steep drop in California condor population. So I brought them into captivity, raised them, again, taking advantage of this idea of imprinting and having people in condor suits actually teach them how to be condors. I went to grad school with a girl that did this work at the, at the LA Zoo, did some work, get on it, got into condor suits and taught baby condors how to be condors. But then you let them out back into captivity and they just go back to being stupid, being stupid and eating glass and pieces of metal, so. Uh, what are you going to do? So that's imprinting, all right? So if you were asked this question, if you were asked this question, what is imprinting, how would you answer that? Yeah? It's a combination of innate and learned behaviors. It's a combination of innate and learned behaviors, and it's basically uh, to associate uh, some individual as your caregiver, right? And concluding or providing a, a, uh, a wrap-up to that. All right, so now we're going to a s more sophisticated type of learning. Um, still not the most sophisticated type of learning or learned behavior, but more sophisticated than imprinting. 
Okay, this is spatial learning. This is learning to associate objects with other objects. So associate objects with other objects. You see this referring to a spatial structure of the environment. Just a fancy way of saying learning to associate certain objects with other objects, right? Certain objects with the location of your nest or certain objects with the location of your food. Right? Spatial learning in, uh, in, in humans happens very early on, right? Human babies learn to associate objects with other objects very early on, and they learn this what's called object permanence, okay? That there are some objects that exist even apart from the association with other objects. But most animals don't actually have this type of learning. But there are some animals that actually are better at spatial learning than we, even we are. A number of birds hide hundreds of caches of food, and so they have incredible spatial memory to pick up on visual cues to know where they've hidden their food. Much better than humans. Even uh, the tree squirrels that live around here, they'll hide hundreds of different caches of food and have incredible spatial memory. Much better than most humans. And so Nico Timbergen, we've seen his name before with our four questions, right? The two how questions, the two why questions. Yes? Okay. Yeah. But he also studied a lot of spatial learning. And here you have digger wasps that build nests in the sand. And here they learn to associate the location of their nest with other objects. And so here associating it with these pine cones that are circled up. Nico Timbergen built these and then they built the nest in and then he moved those pine cones and they actually go to where there's, there is no nest because they've associated the location of their nest with these pine cones, okay? Showing that they use spatial learning or taking up on, on visual cues. Okay, so this is more sophisticated than imprinting, but still not the most sophisticated of learned behavior. We need to get more sophisticated. So what's something that's more sophisticated than spatial learning? So you're thinking like, okay, we've gone from imprinting, which is basically just associating the first thing you see. Most of our examples of our imprinting, associating the first thing you see as your caregiver, right? That's mama, okay? And then we go into spatial learning, where now we're associating an object with another object. What's a, it's something that might be even more sophisticated? Learning yeah, over time. Okay, learning over time. So learning to associate something with your experiences rather than with other objects, right? Sounds reasonable? Yes? No? Yes. Okay. Yeah. We'll stop in just a moment. We'll have our break, and then we'll do, um, we'll finish up our simulation that we started on Monday. So this one is associative learning. So this is where they start to, rather than just associating an object with another object, they start to associate features, experiences, with other experiences. So here, animals associate one feature of their environment with another. A lot of the time we see this, it's associating experiences with other experiences. Look at the example. White-footed mouse. We saw this uh, species on Monday in our cross-fostering work. White-footed mouse and the California mouse, right? Yeah. Okay. And then so here they associate the color of the caterpillar with their, that really nasty taste or even the sickness that comes from eating monarch caterpillars. So now they're associating experiences with objects or experiences with other experiences. Did you have a question? They are. Monarch butterflies are pretty amazing, though, to have a butterfly that's this big that will fly hundreds of miles. Yeah, it's, it's pretty spectacular. And so monarch caterpillars eat milkweed, which is a, a plant that secretes a poisonous uh, material. And so they build up this poisonous material inside of their tissues, which works out really nicely because if you eat a monarch caterpillar, you get sick or you just have a really nasty meal. And so animals learn to associate the color of that caterpillar 
with a really distasteful meal. Yeah. Does the milk not It does not. Yep, it does not, yeah. Do any other, like, species eat the milk food as well, or is it just that? That's a good question. There are other insects that do eat the milkweed, um, and... Uh, it's it's uncertain. I don't know how much work has been done to to show that it actually aids in their survival as well. But monarch caterpillars are very brightly colored. They have yellow and black bands, and so they're very brightly colored, which is very unusual for an animal, especially an animal like a caterpillar that a lot of other animals are going to eat. But it's basically their way of broadcasting, hey, we don't taste great. So works out fairly well. All right. Yeah. Uh, no, because you don't need to be sorry. Like, coloring and animals knowing that they're in fish How long does, like, on average, does one live? Yeah, that's a good question. They tend to live one season. They tend to live long enough for one of the migrations. So a huge population of them will migrate from up north, like northern California and even the northern parts of the Pacific Northwest, Oregon, Washington, even up into Canada, down into Mexico. And then the next generation will tend to return from Mexico up to the Pacific Northwest. So they usually only live for one of those migrations. So, yeah, that's a good question. All right. So that's a slightly more sophisticated type of learning. And we'll do one more type of learning, and then we'll, uh, we'll take a three-minute break and do our simulations. Uh, this is a specific type of associative learning. And it's called classical conditioning. And so this is where uh, animals start to associate a specific experience with some random stimulus. Okay. And so the, the, the classical work done on this was done by a man who I believe his name was Pavlov. That name for some reason came to me right now that it might not be right. Um, but he basically would ring a bell and then give a dog a treat. He would ring a bell and give a dog a treat. And he'd ring a bell and he'd give a dog a treat. And every time he rang the bell, he would give the dog a treat. And so because dogs are capable of this associative learning to associate experiences with other experiences or experiences with a stimulus, they started to associate getting fed with the ringing of the bell. And then so you would ring the bell, and if you didn't feed them, they would salivate because they were ready to eat and to start using that saliva to break down what they were eating. And so they learned to associate eating with the ringing of a bell. Yeah. I remember they did that in, um, they did something like that in like Harry Potter, the, um, like in the, in the seventh movie with the dragons, where they, where they rang those bells and, the, and because of that, the dragon expected pain. Yeah. You know, they, they've done actually a lot of these studies in humans as well. Although usually most of these are in the category of what you would call uh, inappropriate experience experiments where you did experiments on humans without getting informed consent. And so they've done, they actually have a lot of this work done on humans as well. But obviously we're going to be capable of associative learning. But all right, so let's, let's pause this. And we'll continue. Both of the simulations supported our hypothesis. Surprise. All right. So again, this is classical condition. It's a type of associative learning, which is associating an experience with another experience, or an experience with an object, or an experience with just some stimulus. Okay? But it's different than associating an object with an object. More sophisticated type of learning. Another type of associative learning, again, experience with experience, or experience with object, or experience with some kind of a stimulus, we have what's called operant conditioning. And so operant conditioning is basically associating an experience with something you do. Okay? So like with the classical condition, the dogs aren't doing anything, right? The bell rings, the dogs get fed, but the dog's not doing anything. With operant conditioning, the dog would have to do something in order to get its food. And so what you tend to see here is like this type of a setup. A rat is given a, a lever that it can pull. And if it pulls the lever, it gets food. If it pulls the lever, it gets food. 
Okay, so the rat is actually doing something. So it, you can train the rat how to pull levers, which is awesome. And then, so an example of this, predator may learn to avoid a specific type of prey associated with a painful experience, like a lion trying to eat a, 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 an elephant, right? Or even a giraffe. You ever seen a video of a giraffe kicking a lioness? No. It's impressive. Yeah, Isabel. Um, so operant It's different than classical. So operant conditioning versus classical. In classical conditioning, the, uh, the individual isn't doing anything. They're just learning to associate something with a stimulus, okay. like a bell ringing. In operant conditioning, they have to actually do something, oh. right? So like pulling a lever. They use operant conditioning to do like positive reinforcement. This is how they train dolphins and orcas, right? If you lift your fin like you're waving, you get a fish, right? Sorry to ruin this for you, but orcas don't actually wave to people. They're not saying hello. It's operant conditioning. Yeah, Tori. Um, are giraffes herbivores? Yes. Um, yep, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Trinity. So, uh, this is basically like your associating It's associating a, uh, yes, associating a behavior with an experience versus associating an experience with a stimulus. So that's classical conditioning. But both of these, I mean, both of these are associative learning, which is associating an experience with another experience or associating an experience with a behavior. Um, and so in this, yeah, the, the, the animal actually has to carry out some behavior to get that reward, is how you typically see it, or to get that experience. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, the test is going to be primarily on the proximate and ultimate questions, and then a little bit on like the different types of learning. Yep. So like, how would you how would you assess innate versus learned behavior? And he would say, okay, with cross fostering studies, right? If you raise them with other parents and they don't do that behavior, then it must be learned and not innate, right? Cool. So here's uh, classical, or yeah, not classical conditioning. This is operant conditioning, um, where yeah, it ate a monarch butterfly, and so it captured a monarch butterfly. It actually did something, okay, and uh, it associated that with a really bad taste. Look at this bird; it is sick. You see that? Oh, that that's vomit right there. Just in, in case you couldn't tell from the from the picture. All right. So we have imprinting. Very, very simple type of learned behavior, right? Mostly innate, some learned behavior. And then from there, we move to um, uh, spatial learning. And then from there, we move to associative learning. And now we're going to move to cognition, to where an animal actually understands what's going on. So in cognition and problem solving, this is where the animal actually knows what's going on. It's not just associating an experience with another experience or associating an object with another object, the animal is actually problem solving. Okay? It may include awareness. That's self-awareness or just awareness of objects. Uh, reasoning, recollection, judgment. Do you all know that humans are not the only self-aware animals? That means you can recognize yourself. If you put an animal in front of a mirror, it can tell it's that that is an image of itself. Yeah. Is it true that dogs can't? Do dogs cannot do that, but chimpanzees can do that. A number of bird species can do that. Elephants can recognize self, and there are some others. Yeah. How do you know that if they recognize themselves? Um, because they. Don't, so if they recognize themselves, they don't respond like they would with an, an unknown intruder. And so if you put a dog in front of a mirror, it will act as though it's some new, you know, somebody to explore or act aggressively, depending on the dog's personality. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah, dogs just don't recognize it as self. They're not they're not self aware. So they would just. Yeah. As a, like, what if um, what if 
with, you have to be holding your dog while it's... Around. Yeah, they still don't. So they would either recognize it as just like a fake image. Like, so if you gave a dog, like a poster of a dog, it, it typically will not think it's a real dog because it'll go to smell, there's, there's no scent. Uh, but it can actually recognize it as an image of itself. I, I believe. I believe dogs cannot do that. Chimpanzees can, elephants can, humans of course can. My grandma got us one of those like singing dogs you yeah. know, for Christmas and my old dog would like bark at it and like try and like fight it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean it's um it's something this is cruel, don't do it. Uh, but if you put like a mirror up in the territory of a like a, a songbird, like say a bluebird or a cardinal or an oriole, it will just attack that mirror until it shatters the mirror and it no longer sees it. Because it's not capable of recognizing that it's an image of itself, and it's it does not want any males in its territory. Because it's got probably three or four female nests in its territory. All right, so what's interesting is bees, honeybees, tend to be capable of cognition, that they actually understand what's going on in their environment. They don't just associate this color with this flower, that they actually make choices uh, and make judgment calls. And here you can see that they learn patterns and they learn how to recognize even a very similar pattern. So you're like yellow and blue, those aren't really all that similar, but look at these, it's the same pattern, right? Lines, and then, but they learn to recognize that the horizontal lines are different than the vertical lines. That they actually can make judgment calls and, and do some sophisticated cognitive work. So problem solving, uh, this is very, very rare to find really sophisticated problem solving in animals. To where an animal can actually de devise some kind of a strategy to overcome some obstacle. So you have a few species of birds that do it. Ravens given you here. Um, ravens, crows, blue, uh, blue jays, sorry. Ravens, crows, and blue jays are all in the same family, and they are incredibly intelligent. Incredibly intelligent Scary. birds. Scary intelligent. Might, in fact, be the smartest of all animals in terms of what they are capable of understanding and what they're capable of learning. Smarter even than chimpanzees. Ravens. Ravens, crows, and, and blue jays. Incredibly intelligent animals. But yeah, so actually being able to find sophisticated problem solving, this is, this is pretty much the highest level of learning, okay? And then it would involve a lot of tool use. You do find it in some marine mammals. Um, for instance, there are some dolphins that feed on fish inside of coral reefs. And to keep from cutting up their face, they'll actually take sponges from the coral reef and put it over the top of their rostrum. And then so then they'll dig their face down into the pockets inside of a coral reef and pull fish out and their nose is protected by sponges. And so they use tools. Yeah, it is. So when you have animals that are capable of high levels of learning, you tend to find uh, culture. So again, this is another word that when we see it um, in biology, it has a very different meaning from what we tend to use uh, to explain or how we tend to use culture. So in biology, culture has a very specific meaning. It is a system of information transfer through observation or teaching that influences the behavior of individuals in a population. Okay, so animals that have really sophisticated learned behavior, uh, culture tends to be a very powerful force. Okay, that is they learn to behave the way that's expected to be part of the group. To be part of the group. Yeah. How would you like say that definition in like a simpler way? Yeah. Like, like, yeah. So uh, you would just say something like, um, uh, "Culture is a combination of learned, a combination of information for learned behaviors." So culture is a a combination of information for learned behaviors. So it's like this one of fit in, so they do what other people do, kind of? Yeah, there's part of it that, so yes, um, with animals with really sophisticated culture, <clears throat> that, yeah, sometimes they'll behave in such a way just to remain part of the group. And so you'll see this in some animals, <clears throat> that they won't reproduce 
<clears throat> because they can't if they want to remain part of the group. There's maybe one breeding pair, and then the rest of them, in order to remain part of the group, they have to forego their own reproduction. And so that would be a cultural influence. Uh, but a lot of it is just a combination of like, this is how you have to behave <clears throat> in order to maximize your survival and reproduction, right? It's like if you really want to survive a long time and you want to have as many offspring as possible, then you have to learn from those around you and operate not just to be part of the group, but so that you can maximize your own individual fitness. Yeah, that's a good question. All right, any questions here or thoughts? Concerns. We have one last section of the uh, the the chapter fifty one to talk about, and it's uh, the idea of inclusive fitness. And so, rather than actually going through um, all of the slides, I'm going to uh, forty seven. Um, I'm going to kind of sum this up, talk to you a little bit about what inclusive fitness is, and then we'll move ahead. Uh, to do our last experience for the class, our, our essay experience. So let me move this over a little bit, give myself some room to write on the board. So the slides will pick up what I'm saying, but won't pick up what I'm drawing, okay? So you should probably replicate what I draw on onto here, okay? We good? Okay, so fitness. We've mentioned this term before, you've learned it before in biology. Um, in biology, what fitness basically boils down to is net offspring per individual. Okay, that's what fitness basically boils down to, the net offspring per individual. So if you were to measure, if, I, if you were to measure my fitness, okay, I have three children, and so I'm going to replace myself with three children, okay? But then also my wife has to replace herself with the same three children, so I don't get full credit, plus each one of my children only have half of my genetic material, so there is a pretty good probability that not all of my genetic material is contained in my three children, right? that there's some of what makes me me that's missing from them. Yeah? So does that, does that like work in all species? You, of what fitness is? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, that fitness is basically net offspring per individual. And that's what we tend to mean when we say fitness. And so you, you, you all learned uh, natural selection, right? Survival of the fittest. And so what that basically means is that the individuals that produce the most offspring are the fittest individuals, right? So it's not like fitness in biology isn't like physical fitness, okay? Different meanings, okay? Now fitness, which we'll call F, okay? We okay with that? Mm -hmm. I know this is a biology class and not a math class, but we're gonna call this F. So fitness is equal to a combination of direct fitness and indirect fitness, okay? So fitness is a combination of direct fitness and of indirect fitness. Okay, is that all right? We're all tracking? Like, I love this. I love animal behavior. I love everything that this class has to offer. I even love the way you teach it, Dr. Engel. You're so wonderful. I know, I get it. <laughs> Disregard that when you listen to the recording, if you're a parent. If you're not, don't disregard it. <laughs> All right, so fitness is equal to direct fitness and indirect fitness. So, the, sorry, rather than just saying and, let's say plus. Direct fitness plus, I mean, and means the same thing, but I want to make it very specific, okay? So direct fitness and indirect fitness. Direct fitness is your offspring. your offspring, and then your offspring's offspring, okay? So like individuals that descend directly from you. What do you think indirect fitness is? No. Not your offspring, but they still need to be somewhat you. Yeah. Would that, would, would that have to be like 
Like, let's say, like, your brother's off. Yes, exactly. So this is your relative's offspring. And this will be apostrophe after the S, showing that it's plural, your relative's plural offspring. And I know I ran out of space and it's written sideways and it's crooked, I'm sorry. Okay, so direct fitness are your offspring and your offspring's offspring, right? Your children and your grandchildren. Indirect fitness are your relative's offspring. And so we call all of this the fitness, or sometimes you'll see this referred to as the inclusive fitness. Inclusive fitness, you see that right here on this slide, is this fitness. It's total fitness, both direct and indirect. Okay? And you have to keep in mind that fitness is a combination, so inclusive fitness is a combination of your offspring plus your relative's offspring. Because they're also going to give copies of what makes you you into the next generation. Yeah, Kyle. Could you have one without, so could you have direct without indirect? Or does it have yes, yeah. If you don't have any close relatives, then all you have is direct fitness. So right? So let's say you're the, <clears throat> yeah, you're, you come from an animal where they only have basically one offspring in their entire life. And if that's true, then they're going to go extinct pretty soon because that means two parents are being replaced with one offspring. It's not, it's not great. Those aren't great numbers. But let's assume that was true, then all you're going to have is direct fitness. You don't have any close relatives. So would that be called inclusive or just direct? Uh, it would just be direct. Yeah, I mean, if there's no indirect, I mean, there's no need for to, to use the term inclusive fitness. Okay? And so basically what 5.4 is all about is that because your close relative's offspring is still part of your fitness, inclusive fitness will explain why animals will do some very strange things. Like, was it, Emma, were you asking why do bees die when they sing? And so we, I answer that question with how bees die when they sing, right? That it, it has a barb on it, it gets stuck, and it basically rips their body apart. Why? they're willing to do that is a completely different question. And it's answered by inclusive fitness, indirect fitness. The queen happens to be the mother of every worker bee in the hive, right? The queen is the mother of every worker bee in the hive. That's how a beehive works. The queen makes all of the individuals in that hive. So every worker bee is a sister of every other worker bee. On top of that, the bee genetics is very strange, so they're all sisters, and they're more closely related than sisters usually are. So we did this on the very first day of class, and I know, Rick, you weren't here to see it, but we went through a calculation to how to determine how closely related two full siblings are. Do you remember those numbers? 50, 50 yeah, so about 50% of your genetic markers should be present in your full sibling, okay? Worker bees, actually have a 75% relatedness. So they're all sisters, and they actually are sisters that are incredibly highly related to one another. So it makes a lot of sense why they would sacrifice themselves for the good of their mom, ultimately the queen, because their mom can replace them with a lot more sisters that's then going to carry on their genetic material to the next generation. How do bees, well, why is theirs so different? The reason it's different is because of the genetic makeup. Male bees only have one copy of the DNA. Mm -hmm. Female bees have two copies of the DNA. And so most animals, adults, or most animals, individuals, just have, always have two copies of the DNA. But bees are strange that males only have one copy and females have two copies. But so the, and the reason why the, all the, the sisters are so closely related is their dad is their brother. So the, the, the queen has some male offspring that will then fertilize her eggs, and then they'll kick all the males out and they'll die, and she has stored up fertilized eggs to make more females. But because their dad is their brother, they're highly related. Yeah. Why do the males get kicked out? Because they they're not necessary once they fertilize the eggs of the they're female. Useless. They're not useless. They just, they, 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 they females can do the job just as well. And they're, yeah, they're just capable of, of more than the males. They're not useless, but their use does not outweigh the cost of having them eating some of the nutrients. Yeah. 
So again, this can be used to explain why do you have some really strange behaviors in animals? Like why will naked mole rats forego reproducing? Only the queen actually reproduces. And it's again, it's like bees. They are highly related to the queen. And so the queen will produce more siblings for them and therefore their genetic materials make it into the next generation. Or why will some birds forego making their own nests to stick around and help raise their siblings the next year? So like a, a chick will hatch and then the next year when she comes back from migrating, she won't make her own nest. Instead, she'll be a helper to help her parents raise her siblings. And the reason why you're like, why would you do that? That's sacrificing all of your fitness. But it's not because she's enhancing her her relative's ability to make more offspring. Yeah? How was the queen of the hive decided? Oh, that's an excellent question. So it, uh, it, it, the queen actually starts the hive. So there's no decision in the hive. A queen leaves and goes and sets up a hive. Um, now, in order to make a new queen, you have to f feed a larva the royal jelly. So they get a special food that makes them develop into a queen. They get fed something different that triggers them to develop into a queen. And so that's like if a hive gets really big, they have to send out new queens to grow new hives. And so they'll feed some larva, the royal jelly, they'll develop into a queen and they'll leave. Yeah. Are queens easily identified? Yes. Yes, they, they're huge. They're either really big, which isn't true for all species, or... Uh, whenever they, they never leave the hive, or if they do leave the hive, they're protected by a complete swarm of other bees. So they'd be at the center of a ball of bees. A swarm of bees, like, out? Uh, like, is that so, like, if they need to abandon the hive for some reason, and they have to move to another hive, you know, you'll have this happen, like, say you have a beehive and a tree in your front yard, and you cut your, that tree down, and so the hive has to move the queen will leave and will go fly somewhere else and she'll be protected by the worker bees. They'll, they'll surround her in like a little uh, pocket of love. Yeah. Okay. The royal jelly, I, 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 don't, I don't know exactly. I've seen that term uh, used a lot. I don't, it's just a different food. So it's all made from nectar. You know, they take, they, the bees collect nectar, they bring it back, they make it into honey. Right, and then the honey is fed to worker bees, the honey is fed to larvae, the honey is fed to the queen, and the royal jelly gets something different. There's something in it that causes them to develop into a queen. Yeah, as far as what that is, I, I, don't, I don't know. I, somebody knows the answer to that question, the answer is out there, I just don't know. And you had a second question. Yeah, what is a beehive? What is a beehive made of? Um, material that the bees secrete, almost like saliva. So the bees will eat material. So a lot of wasps will make their nest out of like paper. The wasps will eat either paper or will eat wood. And then they'll, they'll make a saliva that's almost like a paper. Sometimes they'll just use the paper. They'll get it wet and they'll build it. So you can find wasp hive made out of newspaper. And in some sections you can actually still read some of the words. But the beehive, most beehives are made um, either by burrowing, just clearing out. Like if they make it in a tree, they'll just clear out space and then they'll make little pockets for the larvae to be in and to develop the honey, process the pollen in, and nectar into honey, they'll make it out of a saliva. So, yeah. So, what, so I have like two questions. So the difference between the larvae and then like the worker bees, how come the worker bees don't become queens but the larvae become queens? Like are larvae queens? Yeah, it's a good question. Well, the, uh, the worker bees are already too old. They're, they've already, I mean, you wouldn't want to make them into a queen because they've already lived a certain amount of time. And there's a key point in development in order to uh, get them. Now, worker bees can reproduce. And so you will have some species of bees where some of the workers will reproduce. And so not, they're not different really developmentally from the queen. They're just different behaviorally. Mm. So like and then some bees, because some females will reproduce, you'll have some bees that their job is the police force. And their job is to make sure other females aren't reproducing. What happens if they do? Like, then they get kicked out of the hive. Pro or eaten. Or eaten. Yeah. <laughs> uh, can there be more than one queen in the hive? Yes. yes. Yep. In some species. Some species, no. Some species will only have one queen in the hive. Or you may have a queen in training. Like a larva that's been fed the royal jelly and is developing into an adult. 
and then is, is a queen in training. But there are some species of bees that may have multiple queens inside the hive. Uh, they just what the flowers they eat oh. from. Yeah, so if, if you want like avocado honey, it's made from the nectar of the avocado. Um, do wasps and them, like, do they have queens as well, too? Or, or uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, yeah. there there are a lot of different species of wasps, but the colonial wasps have a queen. There are solitary wasps, uh, where every female is a queen, but if they, if it's a colonial wasp, they have a queen, like, mm -hmm. like bees and honeybees. Yeah. What is a bumblebee? Uh, it's just a Gosh. different species of bee. So I got a, 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 a bumblebee. <laughs> Yeah, they're not honeybees, so they don't make honey, but they still eat pollen. And a lot of them are solitary. Is it true that the big, like, black bubble, do they really, like, not sting? Uh, they tend to be uh, not super aggressive, but I, I think they are capable of stinging. Yeah. yeah. All right. So what's, what time is it? It is 9.38. We have two minutes of class left. Please do me a favor and write down this prompt. So in preparation for class on Friday, if you need to make any alterations to your chapter 51 worksheet that I sent you home with on Monday, feel free to make those. If you don't, then just use that to study and prepare for our assessment on Friday, which will be predominantly based on those ultimate proximate questions. But then we will also do some things on learned behavior, you know, um, learned versus innate behavior. We, we won't in any way assess this. This we'll talk about more and uh, we'll assess it later. Yeah, Tori. So we're answering this. Yes, and also in preparation for Friday, I want you to write uh, an answer to this. You don't need a really long, if you're, if you're gonna ask a question like, how long does this need to be? I'm thinking something like on the order of five to seven sentences. This is a homework? Yes. Okay. Five to seven sentences. What is we? Wean is uh, when they stop being given milk. So when the mom stops giving them milk, then they've been weaned. That's a good question. Leave their mothers once weaned and can travel for hundreds, even thousands of miles in search of resources and females. Please explain this behavior using both proximate and ultimate explanations. All right? I'm so sorry. I, I, I Man, y'all are staying after the bell to write this. That's so terrible. Coach, were you there when Coach Rob squared up on a double swarm of bees? No. Was a swarm of bees nearby? No, I was. Uh, I teach a field course in Michigan every summer, and we do a uh, canoeing trip down a river on one of the days. And um, a group ended up in like a, a mayfly hatch. So the mayflies, the larvae are aquatic and then they'll hatch and you'll have thousands of adults right hovering above where they just hatched as they get oriented. And they, so a canoe ended up in that hatch and one of the girls in there thought it was a swarm of bees and she flipped out and she flipped the canoe. The canoe got stuck under, I mean, it was, it was awesome. Yeah. Is it true that like if a bee's like really mad and you like go underwater and they wait for you above water until you come up to sing? Uh, so, sometimes, but rarely. It depends on how close. It, it depends on how close you are to the hive. Because they're programmed to protect the queen. So there has to be like a hive nearby in order for that to happen. Yeah, if they're gonna be that aggressive, that there 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 needs to be a hive nearby.